uh, to hear more about and discuss an important uh, issue uh, with us, reforming U.S. immigration policy. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, in person or via our college uh, live events YouTube channel. I am Henrik Schatzinger, co-director of the center, uh, along with my colleague, um, Sir Brian Smith. I'm also an associate professor of policy and government. Tonight, we are going to discuss U.S. immigration policy from different uh, perspectives, given our diverse group of panelists. We want to look at some of the problems with our existing immigration policy and discuss ideas for comprehensive immigration reform. Specifically, what we want to discuss whether the current immigration policy strikes the right balance between family-based immigration and employment-based immigration, um, as well as the economic and cultural impact of immigrants and how to deal with uh, undocumented immigrants. The event is scheduled for uh, 60 minutes, but uh, if we're all having a, a good time and there are many questions, uh, I'm sure we can go a few minutes uh, over that uh, time slot. Um, we have uh, three excellent panelists today. You'll only see two right now. One is, uh, one is on her way. She'll be uh, joining us uh, any, any moment. Let me introduce them to you, to my uh, right. Here we have uh, John um, Holy Lord. Not Holy. Holy Lord. Uh, John Holy Lord. Uh, John Holy Lord uh, is the Director of Government Affairs at Dairy uh, Business uh, Association, a nonprofit organization of Wisconsin dairy farmers, milk process, processors, vendors, and business partners who came together in 1989 to help reinvigorate the state's dairy community. Uh, Mr. Holyload grew up on a hog and uh, sheep farm in Northwestern Illinois. After graduate school at UW Madison, he worked for an organization in suburban Madison that focused on federal uh, transportation policy. And Mr. Holyload enrolled in law school a couple of years later. After a stint uh, running his own law practice, he joined the staff of the Dairy Business Association DBA. Uh, this gave him an opportunity to return to policy work and his agricultural roots. While the DBA is based in Green Bay, Mr. Holyboat remains in office in Madison to be close to the capital and relevant state agencies. Please join me in welcoming uh, John Holyboat to our panel. <laughs> also, we have uh, Huma Assam. Ms. Assam founded Madison Immigration Law. Born to immigrant parents as a first-generation Indian American, Ms. Assam witnessed the first-hand effects of our immigration policies and felt the consequences of the ongoing changes uh, of the laws. Uh, born to educated professionals uh, forced to find opportunities in the U.S. not applicable, uh, not, not available in their home country, Ms. Assam was taught to appreciate her American citizenship at a young age. Years later, she would again experience the frustration of the immigration process as she worked through a J1 visa waiver uh, with her husband. Ms. Assam practices general immigration law with an emphasis on professionals in the medical, education, and uh, technology fields, as well as family immigration and naturalization and citizenship issues. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Assam to our panel. I will introduce our third panelist, uh, you know, as soon as she uh, joins us. Um, our plan for us tonight is as follows. We will begin engaging all panelists uh, in a series of questions, and after half an hour or so, we'll have the conversation to questions from you, the audience. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll take, it, uh, take it from here. My first question is, you know, a rather personal one. My, my question is, um, maybe Huma, you can maybe talk a little bit about how immigration policy has affected you personally. And uh, John, maybe you can talk a little bit about how immigration policy uh, affects the Dairy Business uh, uh, Association more broadly. Um, yes, um, well, um as uh, Heinrich was saying, that uh, I was born to immigrant parents. Um, my father came in, I want to say, 1960 as 
PhD student at the, to the University of Florida, um, studying uh, cartography, aerial mapping, geography. Um, at that time in the 60s, um, if you were a PhD student and uh, you were in a field that maybe the government wanted, it was uh, very easy. You would go down the, the as according to my dad, you would go down and they were like, oh, you're here for uh, PhD work. Oh, well, instead of an F, a student visa, would you like to be a permanent resident? You know, it was that uh, uh, easy at that time. So, um, you know, my dad had no problem adjusting from that of a, of a student visa to that of a permanent resident visa. Um, from there, it, I think in the 60s, it was a little bit more difficult in the fact that he was an immigrant professor seeking um, work and uh, seeking tenured work in the 60s. Um, in the 60s, he taught at Stevens Point, but unfortunately, he wasn't able to get tenureship, so Western Kentucky, a little college in Bowling, Kentucky, said, if you come here, we will give you automatic tenure, and there you go, there I was born. Um, from there, um, I grew up uh, with, my, with my dad, who was very educated, and my mom, um, um, interesting note, she knew how to speak a basic amount of English. Uh, for example, she would always tell me that she was learning English at Stevens Point, and I guess the people at Stevens Point are just so nice. She would, went down to the Piggly Wiggly. I don't know if it, there is a Piggly Wiggly there anymore. But um, she was learning English, and you know that the sign says, buy one, get one free. So she took the detergent and walked out of the store because she said, it's free. Right? <laughs> you know, so, the, um, so she had to explain the cash. The, the, um, the clerk had to explain, no, 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 it's not free. You have to buy one, get one free. So, um, you know, for, from a very early age, you know, whether it's... Um, you know, my dad was a professional and, and my mom was learning um, English as a second language. Um, it's always been, uh, you know, a challenge, you know. Um, I grew up with the American experience of being an immigrant, um, but I really didn't feel like an immigrant. Um, I grew up, um, my parents spoke um, their language, which is Hindi and Urdu. Um, I could understand it, I could probably speak it, uh, but very few people in Kentucky at the time had that. You know, we're speaking Hindi. Uh, so um, that was my background. And then I met my husband, who is came from Pakistan and who was on a J-1 visa, which is, just to put it short, a very terrible visa. And if you ever have the opportunity of getting that visa, you should aptly reject that visa. Um, and we had to go, either we had, after I graduated law school, um, we had a choice. Either we could... Uh, move to a medically underserved area, or we could move to Pakistan. So naturally, we moved to North Dakota. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and then from there, you know, I mean, this whole immigration experience is my whole experience is what brought me to this point of doing immigration law. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> thank you, Uman. You mentioned uh, you know, J one visas. Uh, I'm a personal J one story to tell, and so. I came to the country also on a J-1 visa as a Fulbright student, uh, and in my case, well, let me think, uh, it took, um, I want to say, nine years before, you know, I went through different stages of my education here, uh, and then I was told, oh, you have to go back to Germany for, you know, two years uh, before you come back. And so what happens in our current system, right, is the fact that you can basically have your roots here and everything, and at some point they say, oh, by the way, um, and I also had a waiver from the German Fulbright you know, Association. I had all kinds of documentation, uh, and they said in, in one sentence, denied, uh, go back, we don't right. care, right? right? And that's kind of one of the frustrations that, you know, that can be. Right, right, right. And if you were in the 60s, if you had come in the 60s in my dad's period, they would say, oh, you're so talented. We need your talents, we need your things. You're coming to study government or politics, and then, oh, why, instead of being a J, why don't you become a permanent resident? You know, so that's, those are some of the, the interesting differences in terms of students that are coming to um, our country to study uh, now versus in the 60s. Uh, so I think that's, you know, really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, John, can you speak a little bit about how immigration, you know, affects the Dairy Business Association? 
Sure, well, uh, obviously one of the things that probably comes to mind for most people first is that a lot of our employees are recent immigrants to the United States, and that's definitely true. Um, the latest statistics are actually still a bit dated. They go back to some work that the UW did in 2008. They showed around 40% of the workforce on our dairy farms were immigrants. Um, again, that's old data that was probably underreported when it came out. So easily the majority of people who work on dairy farms in the state now uh, are of immigrant background. Uh, we have dairy farmers in the state um, and other processors in the state who are of recent immigrant background. Uh, whether they're Dutch, there was a sort of exodus of Dutch dairymen to the United States um, who were attracted here by incentives by our state the president of our association is an immigrant from Canada who built a dairy farm here as well because we're a really great place to dairy. We have a lot of processing, we have great weather for cows. Um, we're kind of the perfect uh, setup if you want a dairy. We're a good place to do it. Uh, look at our license plates, right? So, uh, so from our employees to, again, uh, you have Italian immigrants, uh, Italian immigrant families who've come here to build cheese plants. Um, so we have people on both ends of the spectrum, and really without uh, immigrant labor, there would not be a successful dairy industry in our state. Um, it just simply could not be, and we're not alone in that. Um, we're one of probably several uh, sectors of the economy that without that labor pool, uh, we simply could not be competitive, nor do we know how we would honestly find the workers to do the jobs. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe can you speak a little bit about the specific sort of detailed sort of issues that you are working on? You mentioned, you know, in your introduction, or I mentioned that you were working with state agencies, uh, you know, closely in in, in Madison. Uh, I'm sure just getting to looking at the sheer numbers of visas uh, and their status of immigrants is, a, is an important issue. But what are the sort of issues that you are working on specifically? Well, we're a state-based organization. We focus most of our policy work the state level. Uh, we do have an affiliated co-op, and that co-op does federal uh, legislative work. So at least as the association, most of our state policy work does not have to do with immigration. Mm -hmm. Although occasionally it does come up because we have laws that are passed that are perceived uh, to be anti-immigrant, or I think any one rational person would say beyond perceived to be anti-immigrant, they are flat out anti-immigrant, and that's one of the things that we do get involved in. Um, also potentially some policy changes. One of the things we like to see happen is uh, some sort of driver's card or driver's permit for people who don't have uh, all their documents in the state. Uh, it's a safety issue. It would certainly help with our employees who might have to get to very rural locations and have no other options other than to drive. Um, so that's something that we can do at the state level. But as far as visa work goes, that's all going to stay with the federal folks. Uh, we have a couple of things we are looking at there. But honestly, in this environment, uh, politically, we would take whatever we could get. <laughs> so uh, there are several different options for reform to the visa system that would definitely benefit uh, dairy farmers and the agricultural sector. We are open to any and all of those uh, that could possibly get uh, probably 60 votes in the Senate is what we really need, something to get 60 votes in the Senate. Um, and if you have an idea of what that would be that could get 60 votes in the Senate, we'd be very much open to your suggestions. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Uh, as we have seen, uh, we have our third panelist now uh, here with us. Let me introduce her um, to you as well. Uh, we have Marissa Lisa. 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 Mm -hmm. With us, uh, Mrs. Lisa was born in Saltillo, Mexico, but grew up in Green Bay. She holds a bachelor's degree in psychology from uh, St. Norbert College and is a bilingual admission um, advisor at UW Green Bay. Uh, at this point, she is also a member of Voces de, Voces, Voces, Voces de la Frontera, sorry. <laughs> a community organization led by low wage workers, immigrants, and youth to seek to protect and expand civil rights and workers' rights through leadership development, community organizing, and empowerment. Some of the campaigns uh, uh, of Voces is, uh, are civil rights, social issue, uh, social justice issues, which have mobilized uh, thousands to take um, action. Um, also, uh, a campaign that you've been involved in as a field organizer is the immigration reform campaign. Uh, you know, a campaign that uh, includes legalization of undocumented immigrants with a path to citizenship. Um, 
and also the new uh, sanctuary movement and deportation defense. Um, so I want to uh, welcome uh, or join you and welcome, please welcome uh, Marisa to our panel. So maybe you can just speak a little bit about your personal journey. I asked them sure. about their personal, sure. uh, you know, their personal sort of background and, uh, and questions, and you know, you have an interesting story to tell. So please share a little bit about. It. Sure. Well, my name is Marissa Lisa. I'm really fortunate to be here with all of you today. I actually was born in Saltillo, Coahuila, which is actually the northern part of Mexico, right down south of Texas. All right. So. My family wanted a better future for myself and my for my three older brothers, right? That's actually what any immigrant wants, a better life, you know, that American dream. Uh, so, you know what, all my life I have been undocumented. And that's actually the correct term to actually use, not legal. I know a lot of, you know, social media, you know, even Donald Trump as of now uses that term and the correct term is actually undocumented, okay? <laughs> Um, we are people, right, with, that deserve respect and dignity, okay? We need to be treated with respect, all right? But even as of myself being undocumented, you know, I always had that, you know, fear notion around living undocumented, living in the shadows. My dad and my mom did not have a social security number, neither did I. I didn't really have a driver license until I was 22, okay? That's, I believe, really an obstacle for, for some of us, right? Not being able to be safe on the road, not being able to know if even my parents could come back um, from work, okay? There's a lot of deportations, over two million deportations in the Obama administration as of now. Um, my dad was one of them, okay? Um, he was deported three, almost three years ago, all right? Uh, that's actually been the most uh, grief kind of experience in my life um, and you know even myself I was actually fortunate enough to have what is called a deferred action that's actually an executive action that was administered by the President Obama back in 2012 um, but it's actually just for the youth uh, you know it's not for the parents okay and I believe the dreamers which we are called the dreamers right are the parents you know, they were here first than, my, than, than me and my brothers, and they deserve the same treatment. They deserve the same rights to be here. Um, I'm actually with that kind of deferred action. I'm protected against deportation. Um, so it's a two-year permit just for jobs, for employment. It's not for education purposes. Here in the state of Wisconsin, you know, there's out-of-state and state tuition for undocumented. That's another thing. You know, being undocumented, I am not able to, you know, apply for financial aid. I'm not able to apply for loans. And that's a big obstacle for the youth who want to go on to further education. Uh, myself, I was really blessed to have a full ride scholarship to St. Norbert College. All right, I think that's actually an achievement for myself and for my family. Um, it's actually the reward. Uh, my, myself, I always wanted to pay them with something, and education was, you know, the key. I believe education is the key to success, you know, regardless of where you come from, regardless of where you, you know, of your race. Um, but it, it's been a really struggling kind of experience, my dad being deported, um, you know, with kind of the whole immigration reform. There should be laws, I agree there should be laws, but there should be humane laws, all right? ICE, Immigration Customs and Enforcement, one day comes to my house and just picks up my dad and pretty much, you know, my dad is put in the plane, handcuffed from the neck to the feet, not fed over 12 hours. All right, is that humane to you guys? No, right. So that, that's one of the things I would really want to see in the immigration form. You know, I, you know, it, they're doing their job, but I believe there's actually more, better ways to actually enforce loss in the, same, in, in the United States. Um, and so, and with, even both the Frontera, I've actually worked with them two years ago, but we've been advocating, advocating, and I believe that's the first start. Advocating for the whole immigration form. 
we actually helped out two young fellows whose father was deported. They were only 13, 12 years old. I was lucky enough I was 22, but there's children out there who does not have their mom, their dad, and they're just children. They were born here as well. So uh, it, it's been a struggle for the American dream. Right? But I believe, I believe I've always been hopeful, always been hopeful. Um, there was DAPA, okay, DAPA is actually deferred action for parents of Americans or those who with permanent residence. Um, that was actually not passed in Supreme Court. It was a 4-4 decision and it did not pass. And it was actually for the parents. Um, so uh, there's been a lot of things, you know, that have not been successful and I believe even as of now, with you know presidential elections coming up, I believe immigration reform should happen now, as of now. So that's a little bit about me. That's a little bit of the obstacles that I face um, with you know immigration reform. You know, there's a lot of contributions that the immigrants have contributed. It's not just an issue that has happened as of now. It has happened you know two centuries ago with Benjamin Franklin being the president. You know, Germans coming in is not just an issue with Mexicans. It's been always an immigrant, you know, population here in the United States. It's not just about Latin Americans or you know other type of ethnicities, right? Because it's not just Mexicans; it's Asians as well. But you know, it's always a focus of Latin Americans for some reason. But you know, we are here for work. For work, my dad, you know, he was a dairy farmer. Uh, he worked for over twelve kind of hours every single day, and I actually witnessed that, you know, during the summer working with him and so forth, but we are hardworking human beings that need to be treated with respect and, and um, dignity. Yeah. Um, thank you, Marissa. I think it's so, you know, so important to hear from, from, from you, you know, uh, directly and not just look at, you know, statistics and, and, and um, you know, it's good to put a face really to these kind of stories. That's kind of you know that's really that's, that's really powerful. Uh, before the panel started, we had a brief you know brief discussion, and uh, you know as, as an immigration um, lawyer, you have a list of pet peeves oh, I wanted yes. to say you know that 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 you you know encounter on a regular basis when it comes to immigration. So before we look forward at like solutions and a path forward, I want to take one more step back, kind of see sort of what are <laughs> what are the issues when it comes to uh, to, to immigration, um, you know, one of the questions I wanted to get to is a little bit looking at family-based versus employment-based uh, immigration. Roughly two-thirds of permanent immigrants are actually coming through the family pipeline, so to speak, uh, and only one-third through, through employment. But the question even among family, and uh, Tim Kaine just, you know, a few days ago came out and says, you know, any comprehensive immigration reform has to have Family, family unity as a key pillar of, uh, of immigration reform. Now, I you know, want to go back and sort of see what are the key issues that you see on a daily basis in, in, in processing um, immigration cases? Thank you. Um, well, uh, in preparing, I, uh, I kind of, I didn't really know what to prepare, so I just made a list mm -hmm. of things that kind of annoy me as, a, as an immigration attorney. Um, some of the things that I, I get really irritated about are, for example, um, currently in Wisconsin, we do not have an immigration court of our own. If you are typically undocumented, this is typically how it works in Wisconsin. If you are undocumented, um, typically from what I've seen is that, you know, you have to drive home, drive someplace you don't have a license, or you're in a car with somebody, um, the police stop you, let's say in certain counties, like Juneau and Dodgeville and some other counties, um, you get stopped and the police says, you know, let me see your driver's license and you say, I don't have one and the police officer at that point can exercise uh, prosecutorial discretion and saying, okay, you can go on or okay, let me, let me write you a ticket and in certain counties they, they will say, okay, you need to come in to uh, the police station and they will hold you. Um, at that time uh, until a judge comes forward to kind of look at what's going on. At that point, you, you're, 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 if, you, if they feel like you, there's an immigration, they could place in what's called an immigration hold on you. And then at that point, um, 
you're kind of in the system um, to go to one of the two detention centers in uh, Wisconsin, which is one is located in Juneau County, the other one's located in Dodgeville. From that point, um, the court, immigration law judge from Chicago will, will um, video conference in. It takes about 21 days, and at that point, they get to determine whether or not you're going to get a bond or not, or be, basically, you're going to be released or not, and how much that bond is. So it takes 21 days. So if there's about 21 days, average national, it could even be longer, that you're sitting in a detention center like Juneau County or Dodgeville, waiting for, to even know if you're going to be re released. From there, um, you get a notice to appear at the immigration court. Um, to determine whether or not you're going to, um, if you have any defenses. So, for example, I take a lot of um, asylum cases. I have people who have horrific stories that are coming to the United States to, to escape from horrific situations. So, when we go to immigration court to, for a notice to appear, the date, after that date, they set it for an actual date where you get a merit hearing. The actual hearing where you can actually argue about the merits of your of your client, let's say if I'm representing you, I'd be representing you in court um, for the actual merit of your case. From the time that you show up for the notice to appear and the time that I actually get to argue her case in Chicago, it takes about five years. So, for example, last year, was it 2000? Yeah, last year was 2005. All my years are kind of blending together now. So last year I had a, I had a yeah. <laughs> oh, that's right, 2015. But um, last year, uh, 2015, I had a case, and the close, I said, is there any other date? And they said, the earliest date that we have is 2019 for a merit hearing on the case of an asylum seeker. Um, so that's one of my pet peeves, is that we only have one court, immigration court, that's in Chicago, and it takes about five years. The I feel like the staff is, you know, I mean, Chicago is handling uh, cases from Wisconsin and um, I think Iowa, so it's like Wisconsin, Iowa, and Illinois. All of those cases go to one center. There are some areas of the country, a lot of areas like Colorado, they have two immigration courts. Florida, they have, you know, I mean, you know, we've got Chicago and they're covering three states, so that's one of my pet peeves. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I really feel like, uh, and, and Especially with Chicago, you know, you can just see it that they're overworked. The staff is overworked. They're, you know, I mean, you know, let's say that's that's my first pet peeve. Uh, my second pet peeve is, is that if, if, I, if you don't mind, uh, I'm wondering also sure. from your perspective, because I'm sure you have friends who are going through the immigration process and then wondering. We hear about how slow everything seems to be in the immigration sort of system. What you know? What are the things that you hear from from people? Um, you know, who are maybe waiting to go through the maybe even like the legal process, but are just being held up through the bureaucracy. Well, there's been a lot of kind of waiting uh, type of issues with specific cases. I mean, every immigrant has different type of cases, and everyone's case is different, right? But with a visa backlog, you know, it's all those, you know, even the ten-year, three-year bars all those issues, you know, waiting for a residence card or waiting for a visa, but it, it's just, you know, I know there was a, kind of a case where when a um, family or uh, my friend actually kind of was requesting a residence card, a green card, that's what they are called, um, and it pretty much took her like at least 10 years to get that green card. Um, it's just a really, really long process, and she was petitioned by, I believe, her dad. Um, so it, it, it's really kind of, you know, a frightening kind of issue because you're living in the shadows most of the time and, and even with kind of the, how uh, the immigration attorney, she was mentioning the kind of um, even deportation process, right? There's two facilities here in the state of Wisconsin, but my dad did not even have that opportunity of to see an attorney or to see a, or a, a judge. Um, so, it, you know, it varies throughout everyone's cases. Uh, my dad just was at the judge kind of facility for two weeks. I just saw him two times because they're so visiting, maybe once a week. Um, and then after that, I haven't seen him, you know, and it's just kind of really hard because, you know, I hear a lot of other stories that, you know, 
they have you know criminal records and they are able to appear in front of the judge and they get to stay here at least for a year and they can kind of fix your whole situation to go back to their homeland but my dad you know he has been he's living here for 19 years and he had his whole family here and you know he pretty much had his whole you know it's everything established here so you know, just having even a year of, you know, kind of preparing her, her belongings, the belongings, you know, just kind of making sure, you know, our home in Mexico was, you know, good for him to go back. That would have been, you know, much a rather better situation for my dad, but it's just different for every people, every person. Thank you. Do you want to, you know, just continue with your with your list, or uh, <laughs> just again, maybe just get a few more points well, across? I, yeah. I just wanted to add to her her comment is just that you know, at immigration courts, you do have the right to counsel, but the government isn't going to pay for it. You, as the immigrant, will have to pay for that. You know, and um, many times what happens is is that the relative is in one of these detention centers, and the person who calls you is their family, saying, "Okay, I don't know where my." My, my family member is. Uh, I'm like, okay, well, many times I ask, well, where'd you get arrested? You know, I mean, what happened? Were you around Juno County or were you around Dodgeville? You know, in Wisconsin. I mean, that's basically, I mean, sometimes that's kind of where, where I start from. Um, but yeah, I mean, in, in, in her case, she, she wasn't able to get an attorney, you know? Um, so I just wanted to make that point too, because that's um, a point to make that, you know, you can have an attorney, but the government isn't going to pay for it. And the really interesting thing with that is that, you know, I think it was last year, I mean, we had many, many un unaccompanied minors who would show up at, you know, on the border. And that was a huge crisis, uh, particularly around Texas and Arizona. I mean, if you could just imagine a mom being willing to give up their child to some perfect stranger and saying, okay, I will have this person take you to America and there your life will be better without me, you know, without a parent. Um, so I think there was approximately, you know, 30,000 or even, maybe even more from, what my, from off the top of my head, uh, it's called unaccompanied children. And um, they appeared at the border. And again, they had the right to counsel, but they, there was nobody who was gonna advocate for them. An asylum case is really hard to prove on its own. I mean, you have to prove basically that you are, of a um, religion, social group, member of some, you know, racial organization that the government will be persecuting for. You fear some persecution. That's hard enough to, to prove on a, on, a, on a person who speaks very little English and is an adult. But now if you have that situation with, you know, a 10-year-old child, who's going to advocate for them? So that's another thing. Um, okay, so um, again, um, she talked a little bit about the uh, immigra uh, family-based immigration. That it, it takes a quite a while. There are very, there are quite a few categories depending on your relation, your closeness to the um, sponsoring U.S. citizen. Um, if you're um, a spouse, you're an immediate relative, or a mother, your immediate relative. But again, if you're in the United States, it takes around six to eight months. But if you're outside the United States, it could take over a year and a half for an immediate relative to come into the country to get immigration. Um, the farther down you go, for example, if you're sponsoring your sister or your brother who's under uh, 21 or 18, that you're in a F3 category, which could take you know five, six, seven, eight years. If they're over 21 or if they're married, then they're at four, they're on the bottom of the run. That's gonna take at least 10 years to get in. You know, um, so those are, some, those are some issues when we talk about family unity, um, keeping families together. It's the, the wait time um, with regard to um, people. Another one, I have a whole list. Just tell me when you want me to stop. One more. Okay, one more. Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you one of my, my most recent pet peeves is, is that um, recently um, we had EAD cards, which are Employment Authorization Documents. That's the uh, card that immigrants get to say that they are um, able to work in, in, in the United States. Um, those have been, um, there are um, some factors and, and memos and, 
and directives uh, through USCIS has said that indicate that these should be issued no, uh, no more than 90 days from the date that you file it. So you should get it within one to three months from the date that you file a request. Um, over the summer, we have seen, you know, as immigration attorneys, we've seen that to take at least five months. And these are for people who are, you know, all, all over the spectrum, whether, you know, you're a student, whether you're um, a permanent resident in the process of applying for permanent residency, whether you're wanting even to renew your EAD card. Um, taking five, five months to renew that is, is very outrageous because if you, you have an expired EAD card, let's say you apply one month before it expires or two months, then you're out of work for at least a month or two waiting for that e, the new e, EAD card to come. So I'll, I'll just leave it with that, but I have many more. <laughs> <laughs> I also have many more questions, but our time is yeah, uh, ticking away. Let me ask two more questions, uh, also to get you know, John and more involved. Um, let's, look at, let's look at uh, the kind of impact that you know immigrants have. Uh, you know, one argument uh, that we you know sometimes hear is that you know immigrants may uh, reduce sort of native employment, right? They may take away take away jobs. Uh, what do you what do you see sort of in your in your sector as far as um, you said you will will take you know as much as we as we can? But what do you say about this argument about sort of native? Well, at least in our industry, I don't think that that's at all um, borne out to be true. Um, we have, um, I think of one farmer example in Green Lake County. Green Lake's a pretty uh, rural county, it's the other side, uh, not too far from here. Um, but he's offering starting salaries of $19 an hour, um, which is not a bad starting salary. Uh, for introductory workers, he cannot fill available there can't be too many other jobs in that county that offer that starting wage, and yet he struggles to find employees to fill those positions. So this is not simply a question of, if you paid them more, uh, the problem would go away. Also keep in mind that our farmers are price takers, right? We, we participate in this global market for dairy, so it's not just a question of easy as, we can pay more, and then we can, your price of milk will go up. We get paid by the processors, through an elaborate system called the Federal Milk Marketing Orders. Um, so we don't necessarily have a direct control over that. So eventually we could reach a point where we could pay $25 an hour and we still probably would struggle to find enough workers in certain parts of the state and we'd also go bankrupt. So um, you know, it's, it's not as easy as just saying that we can find those workers elsewhere. I don't think that um, any research has really supported the view that they're uh, a net negative on the economy. Uh, the most unfavorable research I've seen actually shows that for certain segments of unskilled workers, there might be a net negative, but for the overall economy, overall wages, they're always a net positive. Um, so, and again, that's as unfavorable of research as you can get to the situation. There is more favorable research that would dispute even that uh, finding. So uh, the simple reality is we, we need them in this state. We're not alone in needing them in the state, but uh, our demographics are such, if you um, have taken a, a good look at the aging of our population and eventually the shrinking of our, our labor pool in Wisconsin, it is not just a question of uh, whether this would be nice or we could expand more or the economy could grow. We will have uh, serious economic challenges in the next couple of decades unless we're able to uh, find and retain more working age people in our state. Uh, this is one possible method of doing that. It's not the only one. There's in migration and also making sure that more of our uh, people who are born in the state don't leave after they receive an education. But it is one part of the strategy we need to use, again, to avoid what will be a pretty serious economic problem for Wisconsin. Um, thanks, John. I should also mention that uh, we tried to add one more panelist to this, uh, to this group here, someone who is, uh, you know, Quite critical of maybe the the impact immigrants have and the level of immigration, um, and uh, so we, we contacted uh, quite a few organizations at the state and national level. We also asked legislators who come out, uh, in critical, uh, critically of immigrants, uh, and uh, they all refused to to uh, to come today. So I should mention that. Um, I want to ask one last question before we kind of move it uh, move it 
get the audience involved, uh, which again has to do with undocumented immigrants uh, and looking at sort of a path forward, right? So, uh, you know, I actually wrote down some quotes from our current, you know, presidential candidates and see what they had to say. So maybe here's one. Here's one quote. Uh, for, for those here today illegally who are seeking legal status, they will have one route and only one route to return home and apply to re-enter under the rules of the new legal immigration system. Um, another quote uh, from, an, from a candidate was, I also understand how you have people in this country for 20 years. They've done a great job. They've done wonderfully. They have gone to school. They've gotten good marks. They are productive and now we're supposed to send them out of this country. I don't believe in that. The first statement is from Donald Trump, and the second statement is from Donald Trump, uh, just four years, uh, four years ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if we are looking at uh, Hillary Clinton's proposal again, uh, you know, she has uh, identified uh, family unity as a key pillar. She says we need to help employers to find out the immigration status of the people they hire. And she, uh, she says we need to provide a path for those that are here if they pay their taxes and submit the criminal record background checks and follow the law over a period of years they could earn the right to citizenship. Um, <clears throat> I can guess sort of, uh, you know, uh, what you think would be the right path forward, but what do you think should be the qualifications for a path to citizenship? Well, that's a hard question. Um, you know, it's just what I kind of mentioned at the beginning. You know, there's been a lot of, you know, Dream Act in our past for the youth in the beginning, 2011. Uh, John McCain kind of introduced that. Um, but there's been, you know, it's just for the youth, even DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, that's actually as of now by President Obama. But we need to kind of include everyone at equal, right? That's equality for everyone, you know, full citizenship for everyone. It's a pathway to citizenship. What does that require? I believe, you know, being even community service, I believe that's a big kind of, um, I, even with being an undocumented, I believe a lot of immigrants are part of community service. So. In regards to what are the components or what qualifies a kind of a person to have, you know, this pathway to the citizenship, it's kind of hard. You know, we actually believe, you know, everyone should be treated equally regardless of where the person comes from, right? But even, um, like I was mentioning, I, think, I believe, you know, equality, I believe keeping families together um, in, in regards to being here legally, not being deported, right? You know, criminal record, um, you know, like I was mentioning, there's been over two million deportations, and I believe, you know, with having a criminal record, yeah, if it's, you know, not being safe to the nation or the country, okay, yes, but, you know, there's a lot of 11.7 million undocumented who are living here, who have contributed to the economy, right? We're not just, you know, working, but we are also consumers. So that's the other thing. It's we're creating jobs, you know, we're part of the labor force, right? We're increasing the jobs. That's the other part as well. It's just like even a college student, it's fine for graduation because they're gonna, you know, buy a car. It's the same thing with immigrants, right? We're actually, you know, with this pathway to citizenship, you know, if we do get this, hopefully, um, with Hillary Clinton being elected, um, we are going to be part of the economy, right? We're actually going to have better jobs. We're actually going to buy more things. So that's actually going to produce more labor, more jobs for the whole country. So that's one of the things I, you know, I kind of mentioned with citizenship. You know, it's actually for the benefit of the country um, as a whole. Thank you. I've uh, used a little time for, for our discussion, and so now I really want to open up to the to the audience. Uh, you can ask whatever whatever you like. Uh, just you know, two questions. Maybe you can just maybe state your your name uh, and you know, possibly affiliation, and then uh, please keep your questions fairly uh, fairly short, uh, <laughs> if you don't mind. So, sure, Rose has a question. 
Um, this is for Mrs. Son, um, and thank you for coming. I think your job is incredibly important. Um, I interned for a Senate office this summer, and uh, probably my favorite part was working with constituent services, which I'm sure you know is inundated with issues with immigration cases. Um, and a lot of these problems come up, a lot of these problems with like EAD cards, like you said, a lot of issues with USCIS pop up. Um, and for, uh, for undocumented immigrants, a lot of the issues come from um, just the timing of USCIS and also a, a confusion of the information that they need or the documents that they need to bring in. Um, I, maybe this is an easy question to answer, but how can we better bring information um, to these people? How can we make um, our agencies that deal with these cases more timely? So the question, just for you, to, you know, viewers, is how can we basically, you know, process many of these cases maybe more, more timely? How can the communication between the people who are on the receiving end sort of be, be improved uh, with the with the USCIS? Well, um, especially in Wisconsin, I kind of find it interesting. Um, you know, um, the amount of work that goes through USCIS and um, that you were interning with the senator's office. You've probably gotten several requests from me. Um, but um, the, um, it seems as though USCIS, in, in various parts, um, the workload has increased. But I don't know, and this is a good question to find out if you're working with senators, have they hired more staff? And I don't think that they've hired more staff. So I think with the problem with the EAD cards, the I mean, there are certain issues like if you're inside the United States and you're looking to adjust, it shouldn't take as long as it's taking. Um, but I think what would be very interesting to find out is, you know, has the staff of the, you know, whatever the information system like USCIS or the immigration courts, it seems like they only have a few, uh, like a certain amount of staff, and that it seems like it's a political question in terms of the budget, you know? Can they hire more, can, you know, I mean, you know, it seems like everyone at USCIS is trying to work to the maximum level because they don't know if they can hire another employee, you know, to another, uh, a field adjudicator, another, because then they would have to request a budget, you know, in their budget an additional amount. And then that becomes kind of, kind of a political issue in terms of, you know, which party is gonna say, you know, I mean, Maybe Democrats would say yes. Maybe Republicans would say no. That's an increase in our government. We don't want a, a, a bigger government, you know. So that's one of the issues that I would say is um, increased staff. Um, another one is um, we only have one USCIS office in Wisconsin. It's in Milwaukee. We really need another one. I mean, to be blunt, I think we need. I this is what I think. I think we need an immigration court in Wisconsin. I think we need an asylum. Um, office in Wisconsin. I think we need two um, USCIS field offices in Wisconsin, um, and I think we need the support staff to do that. So please go back to your senator and tell them that they, we need more staff. You know, and I think that would be one one part of it. Um, but as far as getting the documents to um, the, the the documents to what kind of documents people need, I think ultimately um, each as as you know you. Marissa said, you know, each case is different. Each case is going to need a, a variety of documents, a variety of proof, because, frankly, the U.S. immigration law, okay, let's just say in the basic form, I know I don't have a lot of time, but let's say in the 60s it was very simple, you know, you know, if you meet this, you're in. But since the 60s, we have taken, depending on which administration has come in, you know, whether we, we kind of, we kind of do this pendulum, pendulum swing between that of immigration being an enforcement act and immigration being that of um, family unification, employment, you know, increasing our, you know, um, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, so it, um, uh, employees, so there's a, there is a, a, a wave that's going on here. So what has happened is immigration, no one has come along and said, um, just said, okay, let's throw out the book and start over. What we've done is, is we've taken laws and then we said, for example, all dogs have, have, must wear collars. And they say, except those dogs that have spots don't have to wear collars. And except those dogs 
that are under 30 pounds. So that's ultimately, you know, if we talk about, you know, in, in the basic form of what has happened to immigration law since the 1950s to now, is that we've chunked away at it with different um, bills and proposals. We haven't um, made a clear, streamlined process is what I'm trying to get at. Okay, but still, I'm wondering why is USCIS processing such a big issue when the U.S. taxpayers are not are, are not paying for processing you know, these cases. It's the applicants who are the immigrants who are paying for this, right? And so it's like you're talking about staffing issues and the budget. My to me, it's still puzzling to see sort of if immigrants are and the and the fees are not cheap these days. You know, they're they're going up constantly. And then you know, like in my case for my H-1B case, uh, I knew that they were cutting, they were like waiting until the last moment to process it, and then I had to file like whatever it's, you know, the premier processing fee, oh, yeah. so there's another thousand dollars or whatever it is, right? And so like I'm, I'm still kind of stuck with why is it so hard? Because ultimately, um, so you pay your fee, you pay your for premium processing right now, that pr premium processing means for employment based is that you get a decision within 15 days supposedly, but um, I, I have issues with that too. But um, <laughs> um, that, let's say that that's $1,225, and that's not including your actual H-1B petition. You're, you're looking at uh, around $1,750. But um, so let's say you pay that amount, and so that amount doesn't go directly to USCIS. It goes in probably, and I don't know this, but I have a feeling that it goes to a budget item or a collection account. But USCIS workers are paid from the federal government. You know, um, I, I have, I, that's what I believe. Um, they are under the Department of Homeland Security. They are federal workers, so they have uh, federal um, benefits. And at any time that you want to increase a, an agency, you have to have a budget allocation. Um, you know, in terms of what's your office going to be, what's your, you know, every year it's in the budget, you know, in terms of how much are we going to allocate for, you know, um, the immigration court in Chicago or Department of Justice, the, the Department of, ultimately, Department of Justice, you know, and, and Homeland Security, they have to, you know, bring forward a budget every year, and that goes into the, to the, um, the congressional budget, you know, ultimately, so, um, that's kind of how it is. I don't know if I answered your question or not. No, I think you did. Uh, let's open up to other other questions. Uh, sure, Tim. You've all been asked to, and thank, thank you for coming tonight. You've all been asked to come and talk about immigration policy reform. If you were running for president, what would be the top three bullet points of your immigration policy? And I, I know that's simplistic, but um, how would you create an immigration policy that would be just, economically defensible, and compassionate? Three points. Um, I guess my first one is we can do something with the 11 or so million people who are already here. Um, whether that's um, a path to citizenship or at least some sort of legal status with the eventual opportunity for citizenship for those who meet certain benchmarks. Um, so that's one thing that is essential. Uh, I think we also need to reevaluate how we uh, try to attract uh, immigrants to the country with more of an emphasis actually on filling job vacancies and deficiencies in our economy. And I don't just mean the ag sector, although that's why I'm here representing tonight, but certainly we, we talked about the STEM jobs earlier. Um, those are essential to be trying to get people who, uh, to fill very technical positions in, throughout the country as well. Um, and then I would say, <clears throat> last, something along the lines of, of staffing to make sure we have a more efficient system. Um, you know, the one thing that's interesting, as much as we've talked about how overburdened things are, when we have this rhetoric out there about we need to round up that 11 million people and deport them, not only are we talking about like just logistically how would that work, how would you find 11 million people, how would you house 11 million people, but you've heard what our current wait times are in our immigration court. If you think we can process those people through the existing immigration court system, I mean, that is, it, is re it is ludicrous. It is impossible. It would never happen which is, gives me some solace, actually, because I don't think that's a very good policy, right? So uh, I think knowing that it's impossible can make me feel better about someone saying a bad policy, but still it would be nice if we had um, some good policy ideas out there as well. Well, I believe kind of working with the people, like, and, you know, that 
we have here already, being undocumented or any other type of, you know, being an immigrant, kind of integrating to the whole country itself, you know, getting them to some citizenship and education classes or English classes for them, I believe that's crucial, um, as well as the whole naturalization kind of for the immigrants. Um, we need to kind of have a better system for those, you know, those fee waivers, you know, for them to kind of be part of this country as well. Um, it's really, really a hard kind of question if you really want, if you really think about it, but even building up a wall like Donald Trump is mentioning, I don't believe that's actually going to fix the whole immigration system, right? Because even as of now, I hear stories on underground, underground tunnels, and um, that's actually not going to build. And there's, you know, billions of money that he's trying to implement. Uh, building this wall, having Mexico paying it for, you know, it's kind of absurd if you really think about it. Uh, but there's, you know, the other ways, I believe, having, um, you know, more staff, you know, on border patrols, um, even working with the intellectual agencies, you know, kind of securing the border more. Um, but as a pathway to citizenship, you know, it's just working with people that we have now because Channel, but that's actually the, the issue. But there's more, more than people who are here now. It's people who want to come in. Mm -hmm. what, what would your policy be? Um, the question was, uh, who do we let in in the future? Oh, you want me to, you want me, sure. you want me to sure. give you my, I don't have three bullet points. I have more than three. Okay, so. <laughs> I so like for time's sake. Yeah, okay, I, so. I um, suggest your top three policies. Okay, so well, if we're talking about um, people who are coming in, you know, um, as far as, um, many have talked about a guest worker program. Um, I think that would be just. Um, there's, there's lots of ways that you can bring in people who are needed, particularly in the science, technology, engineering, mathematics field. For example, last year, for the H1Bs, just to put it in short, there's an 85,000 um, cap in terms of visa number or, or um, H1Bs that we give out per year. And that's uh, the, the starting date on that is April 1st. Last year, um, on between April 1st and April 2nd, we had over 150,000 applications, according to US, USCIS, were received in, in two days, and that's why they're always filled. You know, for I mean, they, I mean, if you submit an H-1B for uh, an industry on April 3rd or 4th, forget it. You're probably not going to get an H-1B for your worker. Um, so. First, I would say, and this is a very easy remedy that Congress can do, hint, hint. Um, you can go back to your senator and say, they can just write a bill and say, okay, we will increase the uh, H-1B caps for this year from 85,000 to 150,000, because that's how many we received last year. Um, currently, we have an H-2, an H, these are called H-2A, which is a seasonal worker program. It was supposed to be for the dairy, I mean, for the agricultural industry. Um, it's supposed to be for, to bring in unskilled workers to help in with seasonal work. But the problem with that is that by the time that you figure out, as a farmer, I need seasonal work, the time that you hire an attorney, and then the time that USCIS takes three to six months, your season's are already over, and that visa's only good for one year. So that's just not going to work. I would, can, I, I, can I interject just quickly, sure. too, to be clear on that? It also is completely ineffective for dairymen. So H-2A is, again, designed for seasonal workers. Mm -hmm. We're not a seasonal type of farming, right? We need people to milk cows every day, all year long. Even if we had a farmer who was willing to hire people on a rotational basis, just seasonally to do the milking, they are not eligible for an H-2A because it is not a seasonal job by definition. So that program, which is designed for agriculture, is completely ineffective for our biggest sector of our agriculture. So I would get rid of that program. I would just have an H-2 visa, and if you were, and I would just expand it to um, any sort of uh, agriculture unskilled laborer. For example, for example, in our country today, we need uh, senior aides. You know, people for in-home in-home health care for the baby boomers that are going um, older. Many undocumented people are doing that. Um, or um, lawn care, or you know, if you go into any restaurant in the back, you know, you know that there are a lot of undocumented workers who are the cooks. You know, um, 
you know, so I would have an H2A, or H, I would get rid of that, and I'd just do an H2 visa, and I would set a certain limit, depending on, um, you know, depending on qualifications, and it should be fairly speedy so that people can get, come in, work. Um, I don't know if you want to set a deadline of, of the, that, that um, H2A status being a two-year status, and they have to, you know, register with, you know, maybe um, the E-Verify system. So that would be definitely for the unskilled labor. Um, we talked about the skilled labor. Um, as far as families, um, you know, I don't think that's, I think that's a no-brainer. I think that obviously we need to keep families together in a just world. Um, we need to work on the wait times at USCIS. The immigration courts, it's a mess. You know, we need to have an immigration court in Wisconsin. We need to have two field offices. We need to have, um, you know, we need to have, you know, uh, we need to have the ideas of speedy trial. I don't know if anyone has ever heard of speedy trial in a criminal law setting. Um, in criminal law, you have, um, some states have just described it as 180 days from the date that you're charged to the date that you are, the government has to put on a trial, uh, has, to, has to try you for the charge. I would love to see that for immigration court, that they, they must bring charges if they say that you have a notice to appear if you choose. Like, I have many asylum cases that, are, are very good are very good people. They're, they're people who are running from situations of, like, for example, I have one guy who is homosexual, and in the country that he's from, he will be tortured. I have another one who's a business owner, who um, was a successful business owner, but the government wanted his money and threw him in jail and tortured him. So this is what's going on in the world. And, you know, to wait five years for that, for these, for these people to make a decision is, is unreasonable. So um, I would have speedy trial. I would say to the judge, you know, ICE, ICE attorneys, that you have 180 days to prove your case that my, that my client is deportable, and I would want you to prove it, and I want to prove my asylum case within that 180 days time and, um, so that I can get my, my, my clients um, the relief that they need. And I think that's all I can think of right now. Good question. That's uh, on record quite a few things. Uh, there was a question over here somewhere. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, So my question is for the, the gentleman representing the Dairy Farmers Association. So I think it's fair to say that this election cycle, um, the media has convinced us that people in rural areas, such as farmers, are not in favor of immigration. Um, but you've given us a pretty compelling argument for why they should, why farmers would be in favor of more immigration of unskilled labor. So, are farmers really against um, immigrants who provide unskilled labor? And if so, why is that? So I don't think I can speak for all farmers. I mean, oh, sorry. So you're asking if it's true that farmers oppose immigration, basically, right? There's sort of this perception that people in rural America oppose immigration. Um, at least in the agricultural community, I think most people understand it is essential. And not just because we need people to do unskilled jobs, and we might want to, yes, work abroad or an expansion of H-2A or creation of a new visa category, as Huma discussed, but because we are, it's okay that we uh, have a shift in our rural communities. There might be a cultural shift going on there in some of those communities, but without that shift, there will not be those rural communities. So when we're talking about filling the milking positions now in, in northern Wisconsin, 50 years we'll be talking about filling the teaching positions and the nursing positions and the doctors and in fact we already are having those discussions. So uh, if, if it is true that some people in rural America have some hesitancy about it, and I don't think that's true of dairy farmers who see the value in it. Um, not just again as, as workers but we have members who um, are turning over or are letting their immigrant workers buy in as partners because their children don't want to farm anymore but they want someone to still work the land. And their workers are interested in doing it. And I think that's fantastic. That's what this is about. You know, this, this, this shouldn't be just a question of, you're coming here uh, and we're somehow taking advantage of you. I think our, our farmers here understand that we're partners together in this and we want the best for you and hopefully you want the best for us so we can try and build better lives for each other. Um, so I think there are varying Opinions. Is it true that if you look at rural polling, some places in rural America, people are going to vote against uh, their interest in this particular issue, I think? 
Yeah, that's probably true. But that's not true of everybody. Um, and I think it's up to us in our industry and uh, other people who share similar viewpoints to do a better job of, of uh, reaching out to our neighbors and explaining why these people are beneficial not just to us, but to the broader community. Um, and that's something that we're doing as an association. Uh, farmers are doing on a one-on-one -on -one basis with their neighbors, but certainly they can be doing a better job of as well. I think there were quite a few questions uh, hands up here just to um, so, um, my name is Leah, and um, I am an immigrant myself. I, I'm from France. I've been here for 11 years. I've had different visas and statuses, uh, and I am a child of immigrants in France. My parents were from Italy, and um, they had the equivalent of a green card, I guess, for France, but they never had, uh, they still don't have French citizenship. And um, as an immigrant myself, I haven't really thought much about citizenship. I've always been happy to just be able to work and live here and be here and participate uh, as, as a more economic person, I guess. Uh, and I wonder if that might be a, a solution, like a halfway point between being undocumented and something like a citizenship. I feel like maybe a lot of people think the citizenship is too much to give. And so instead of talking about a path to citizenship or you know, forgiving people uh, being undocumented and just giving them citizenship, if some of a, something of a middle ground, like maybe more looking for work authorization, at least as a first step, would be a possible solution that might make more people happy? Mm -hmm. Well, the question is about, is there really a compromise uh, for undocumented immigrants uh, where we could look at either uh, work authorizations or something like a permanent legal uh, status, uh, either in the form, you know, the green card is a formal way, but there could be a, another new category if you wanted to. Uh, so I'm wondering, you know, what do you, what do you guys think? Well, like I was mentioning at the beginning, I do have that uh, deferred action, which is partially not solving the whole issue of the whole immigration system. Um, able to have a driver license, right, to have a driver insurance and so forth. But that's just, you know, part of it. It's not, I can't apply to financial aid, I'm not actually a resident, I'm just here permanently pretty much. So that's actually just solving, or not partially solving the issue. So we want, I believe, something to completely solve the issue, right? Not just for the youth, but for the whole community, for the whole 11.5, 11.7 um, undocumented population here. So it's not a compromise. We, I believe we've been fighting a lot of years, right, to have some sort of equality, and I believe it's the time. So. Can I just add, um, so when you talked about that you're here on a um, permanent resident, Basis. Oh no, you're all here on a uh, non-immigrant, like now a student a visa card. of some sort. Now I have a green card. Now you have a green card, yeah. but you were on a non-immigrant. Yeah. I just wanted to add that there are different legal standards. When you talk about a non-immigrant visa, a non-immigrant visa means at the, at the end of the day, whether it's an H-1B or an F or whatever non-immigrant status that you have, is that you have the intent to go back to your country. That's what a non-immigrant uh, visa stands for. Now, your legal permanent resident in um, immigration terms, that means that you have the intent to stay in this country. And um, with that um, comes certain privileges. You have, you know, privileges of work. I don't, um, in terms of non-immigrant and legal permanent resident, you have the same uh, due process rights. Um, in terms of, the, I think the only big thing with the citizenship is that you have the right to vote. Um, that's important that you have the right to vote. Um, I think that is, that's pretty much the differences in that. Um, but as far as that being a stepping stone, I mean, it really depends on how you look at it because every state, and it's important to know that every state has benefits. They can choose how much their in-state tuition is and how much their out-state tuition is. They can choose, the University of Wisconsin, Ripon College can choose to say undocumented workers who are who have DACA status will be considered as in-state tuition, you know. Um, so an example, and also for Medicare, 
Medicaid, this happens a lot with uh, my older clients that are coming that are coming to the United States. For Medicare and Medicaid, those are each state has the ability to set their own um, eligibility requirements to a certain degree. Some states have said that you have to be a citizen for five years, uh, have citizenship for five years, I think it was Texas. At one point there was a case that said that they wanted to um, require that um, someone had to have citizenship for 15 years. The courts um, struck that down as being um, overburdensome. But the mass, I mean, so every state can, can determine their own uh, Medicare and Medicaid eligibility. So many states have said that you have to be a citizen. Some states, in, particularly in the Northeast, have said, it's okay, if you're a legal permanent resident, you'll be eligible for our Medicaid or, or sorry, yeah, our Medicaid um, issues. So there's, there's, as far as immigration is concerned, you know, whether it's citizenship, whether it's a uh, legal permanent resident, or, you know, it, there isn't that much difference except voting. But on the state level, there is a lot of differences because the state can determine eligibility for a variety of programs. I think that's, that's such a good question we all want to answer. So, uh, I, would, I would just say that I think you raise an excellent point, at least that for some people it is not about citizenship. Mm -hmm. They would just like the ability to work here. We probably have employers who would like them to work here how we make that easier and more efficient. Um, and so that's one part of the solution to this problem, because for a whole host of people, it has nothing to do with citizenship. That's not the end game for anybody. They gladly take that if that's what it takes to get them to that status where they can work legally and not have to worry about it. Um, but they'd also take several things in between. And so for those people who just want that, I'm all for making it easier and, um, for them to obtain that. Uh, also, I see the point uh, with the, the current undocumented population of some other immigrant communities who are working through the process see it as uh, unfair that there would, if there was an amnesty, for example, the big term that people would be used. Um, the last one we had, by the way, was Ronald Reagan's amnesty, which a lot of people who are so anti-amnesty seem to forget that Ronald is the one who did that. Um, but, you know, it happened. I was six, but it did happen. <laughs> so uh, I would just say that uh, I think there has to be some sort of delay for those people to make it fair. That still means legal status in the short term with the path for some people who would eventually qualify. It makes no sense for someone who spent practically their entire life in the United States to ever be expected to have to return, uh, at least not to me. Um, and we do have numerous examples of people who were brought here as young children. This is, this is their home. Uh, and, they, and, and I can't imagine them not being eligible for the benefits of, of living and contributing here. You know, our, just our undocumented folks in Wisconsin alone earn a billion dollars a year and pay a millions of dollars in taxes each year and help to prop up our social security system with, without their contributions, which they're never they're usually never able to get <laughs> back would be even less financially secure than it already is. Um, so there's definitely a fairness argument for some people eventually having a path forward for those who want it. And can I just add that you know there are some, there are some countries that you know people who come to me and say I don't want a citizen. I mean I come back and forth with my green card. The people at the border, the customs border patrol, they continually harass me. Say why have you got become a citizen? You've been a legal permanent resident for 15 years, and they say I don't want to be. I don't think America is all that great, you know? <laughs> For example, I have this one client, um, she, she said uh, um, she didn't have a college degree. I said, um, you know, you could do X, Y, and Z, and we could get legal permanent residence. She said, no, I want to keep my German citizenship because I can go back home and I can get free education. So I'm going to go back home and get my free education and then come back to the United States. Um, we have time maybe for two final questions. I know that uh, Gary and Eric have been raising their hands. Uh, no, there's another, you know, but we have to kind of wrap it down again, you know, at, 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 uh, at, at some point. I know Gary, you had raised your hand uh, early on with your question. I always ask questions. Uh, I hope none of you, I don't want any of you to take this personally or, or think I'm trying to be hostile, but why couldn't you achieve the American dream in Germany, Pakistan, or Mexico? I mean, why, why, why well, are you here? Um, 
Right now, my dad came in aerial mapping cartography at that time in um, India. Doesn't have any, uh, 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 eventually went down to work for NASA. So India in the 60s didn't have a, a, a NASA program. The only place to come to do aerial cartography and satellite mapping was the United States in the 60s. So that's how, <laughs> I mean, I don't think there is any other place. Other than that, I guess he could have, you know, um, been a farmer. I think his dad owned lots of property, and um, I would be a nice Indian girl, I guess. You know, but uh, <laughs> um, that's that's one of the situations is that in their home country, you know, many people don't have the opportunities that they do uh, in America, and America needs people who can um, create systems to do satellite mapping for NASA. They need people who can make up the next generation of construction materials and engineering and and um, mathematics so that America can keep its, you know, um, innovative streak. Yeah, I can only speak to myself, but I mean, in my case, uh, there was never, for me, a plan to become an immigrant here. I came here, again, as an exchange and Fulbright student for 10 months, and then, you know what happened? Doors opened, basically. and. Uh, New opportunities. Uh, we only have big state institutions, right? So, uh, and they are very focused on research. That would be the number one focus, right? So here, it allows me to do, to do uh, different things, and uh, I've, I've, uh, you know, I've become to kind of love this this country and the people, and uh, and you know, you met, uh, <laughs> you know, a you know, person who will then turn into your wife, who is also in this room here. And so, you know, life happens, basically, right? And so, not always is, or often there's not maybe a master plan behind it, but uh, that's what I can say. But I'm, I'm very grateful for all the opportunities that, that I've been given here. For myself, I mean, I was brought here when I was four years old, so I really did not have a choice. And it's actually, you know, it's my parents' decision was always to have a better education for myself and for my three older brothers. You know, Mexico is actually one of the countries that has a higher percentage of poverty. Okay, you know, in comparison to other countries, um, my dad, he was actually a veterinarian in Mexico. He and my mom was also a teacher in Mexico. So they had, you know, kind of their education and they work, but it was not the same. You know, they still have low wages and in comparison to the United States, it's way different. Even nurses over, I have a cousin who just got earning a four year degree in nursing and she is not able to even survive on herself, by herself. She lives with her parents still. All right, so that's actually one of the reasons why my parents, you know, saw that the education even level was not the same in Mexico. So they wanted a better future. They wanted this country, it's a land of opportunities. Regardless of where you go here in the States, you're going to find something that is way better than your homeland, I believe, in my kind of case, in my family's case. right? Um, because even with Mexico, there's drug cartels, you know, and other kind of violence. Um, so you're actually seeking or leaving, you know, behind all these, you know, other kind of scenarios when you want a better future. And that's what I have received so far being here, um, maybe uh, 20, 21 years here in the United States, um, getting a better education, even English. You know, I struggled along the way um, learning English, but at the same time, you know, I love this country. I, although I was born in Mexico, you know, I have a heart of an American, so that's it. I know that there was at least one more question in the door, so, you know, a few more hands up, but Eric. You focus mostly on the micro issues, and I'd like to step back a little, look at at least one macro one. You described an immigration system which is Byzantine, inefficient, and underfunded. No one has mentioned that that's quite possibly on purpose mm -hmm. because we don't have a national consensus on how much um, immigration should be permitted from where and under what conditions. And absent that consensus, we make it, any attempts to make it easier or make uh, solve your problems are going to be defeated in Congress. 
the words racism and bigotry and ethnocentrism haven't been mentioned tonight, but you better believe they underlie national policy. If you look at the debates, and that is, goes back through the history of immigration from the development of the quota system uh, 100 years ago, and its various ups and downs of who will be permitted and when and so on. So I, I, this is more a statement I'd like you to comment on rather than a question. How can you achieve any of, here's a question out of it. How can you achieve any of these reforms you suggest and uh, get across to people uh, that immigration, even undocumented immigrants, are really helpful? There's an NPR, WPR story on that tonight on the dairy industry, by the way, I saw a couple of hours ago. Um, how can you do that if there's no national consensus? and you still have ignorance and erroneous statements on the national debate right up through the presidential campaign and the stupid wall. So the question uh, focuses on the, on the macro level of immigration, sort of, uh, you know, maybe, not maybe, but uh, there is a real chance that uh, the current problems are there on purpose, basically, and how do we overcome, or how do, what are the arguments we can, we can provide uh, for sort of um, the solutions that we've kind of discussed here, how can we make how can we make that case? So we asked earlier what our, our dream scenario would be, right? If we had to pick three items, how would we reform it? Um, so you ask a much more pragmatic question, um, but a less pleasant one to answer, right? Which is, <laughs> we're not gonna get our dream scenario. Um, there's a joke, of course, in DC that comprehensive, as it relates to immigration reform, means never gonna happen. Yeah. So, uh, we have to be pragmatic. Our, us, you know, as farmers, we are trying to be pragmatic, um, which is why we're willing to accept a great deal less than what we would like as a comprehensive package. Whether that uh, ends up being some reforms to how H-2A is worded so that we would qualify to be able to apply to have workers under that visa program, um, or a new type of visa program. There's also an idea to uh, have a federal delegation of authority to states so that states could run their own visa programs and target industries. I'm definitely open to that concept too. Again, I'm open to, as I said earlier, kind of any concept that I think could get 60 votes um, because I'm realistic to know that uh, I think a comprehensive bill is not going to be uh, likely. Uh, I also think that even if we got a comprehensive bill, it may not be to our liking, uh, the end product, or address everything, or really be what we would consider to be a comprehensive bill, even if it's being sold to us as a comprehensive solution. Uh, so a, a more piecemeal approach uh, to solve some more immediate labor issues is something we're definitely looking at because we have to be pragmatic about it. Well, I haven't given really my kind of dream scenario, but uh, mine would be a little bit more, I think, focused on the employment-based uh, Im immigration aspect. And, uh, you know, if in the classroom, can I show you maybe a graph of, like, the labor uh, supply and the supply of native workers, basically, which is a little bit more of a sort of normal curve distribution. And you look at how the immigrants supplement the labor market, and, and they are often more on the extremes on the labor market, but which supplements the, in terms of the, the, the education level, is very high or low, but uh, still do very important work that Americans uh, maybe, you know, do not you know, want to do, uh, quite honestly, right? And so my, I guess, argument would be much more focused on the, the, economic, the economic benefits that you know, immigrants provide. Uh, I would also look at, uh, and we can look at the jobs that immigrants create for Americans. Uh, I don't know, and you know more about this, but why do we have like an immigrant visa uh, where you have to you have to create ten U.S. jobs okay. and to have like uh, and spend like a million dollars or whatever or uh, you know uh, before you can come here you know I think the Canadians are much more pragmatic and they have, they have a better system in place and why don't we have a system in place is that why is it not good enough if somebody wants to come here and you can, they can guarantee that they will create two jobs for Americans why is that good enough I don't understand sort of as long as there is a you know a certain time frame or you know job security for Americans, but we don't have a system like that, and so we have a visa that is underutilized because the demands are so are so crazy for it. I don't understand that. Well, I kind of want to address the, uh, the gentleman's argument that uh, that we're never going to have a visa system because there's an inherent racism in, in, in 
in the uh, system here. So when we look at American history, I mean, just to be point blank, the idea is that we're, we're never going to have comprehensive immigration again. You know, but if we look at American history, if we look at our own history, you know, um, you know, even from the beginning of this country, we've had, you know, racist ideas. We, you know, chased the Native Americans from their lands. Um, you know, um, if we're going to talk about illegal immigration, we're all probably illegal immigrants. You know, and if we're not Ho Chunk or Potawatomi, I mean, to be quite, to be quite blunt, um, you know, um, we, we've called Native American savages. You know, we've. we've we 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 we've done even forceful immigration for African Americans. We brought them here with the whole history of slavery. You know, um, we you know, so that that idea that you know this with regard to immigration that there's racism built in it. It you know it's always been I hate to say it, but it's always been part of the American um, experience. You know, and immigration is is in any uh, U.S. policy is basically a reflection of our values. You know, and as our values have changed, our, our policies are, are changing with it. And there's another thing that I think, if we're looking at a macro level, um, on the census, according to the census from what I've read, is in 2050, um, more of the U.S. population is going to look like me and her versus this guy here. You know, um, so when we talk about, you know, maybe we won't get comprehensive immigration now, but maybe... You know, when our kids come along and they look more like us and people are more um, willing to look at their neighbor as, you know, a human being rather than, you know, you are a this person from this land, um, then maybe we can achieve some of the things that we're talking about. I would just comment on uh, base back on both of you guys already have covered it, but based on economics, right? The contributions of immigrants here. I know there is two laws here in the state of Wisconsin that um, Scott Walker initiated, AB 450, SB 533. But AB 450 was actually racial profiling, so they uh, permitted the police to actually ask the immigration status of anyone who was Mexican or Hispanic, um, and they would actually kind of have that deportation process already for the person. Um, so we, uh, as both of our from data, we actually kind of organized an event over in Madison, um, and there was actually 20,000, more than 20,000 people there that attended. And that kind of showed, you know, a lot of businesses closed, no one attended jobs, no one attended school, right? Um, and it's actually advocacy, you know, and it actually proved a lot of that economy, where economy is actually to our advantage, right? Immigrants are a part of this country and we work and so forth, but it's an impact that we are able to provide to, the, to this country. So based on economics, I believe, you know, having more information about that in the media, um, focusing on the positivity rather than the negativity, um, like Donald Trump. So we are an hour and a half into this, not one hour, so we kind of went a little bit uh, longer. So thank you for your patience and staying with us. Thank you for your, all of your questions uh, uh, tonight. And uh, I think let's give it up one more time for our panelists here. Tonight. I have one last announcement, which is an upcoming event uh, that the center is sponsoring. Uh, this Thursday at 5.30 p.m., we will have a discussion with our state senator, Luther Olson. He will talk about uh, issues of higher education, transportation, and the state budget, among other issues. Uh, this event will take place in uh, Bill Theater, East Hall 101. Thank you again.